Thank you so much, Bob. And it's my pleasure now to introduce Fang Shang, our next speaker. So Fang is the James and Patricia Poitras Professor of Neuroscience at MIT um, here at the McGovern Institute. And he's also a core member of the Broad Institute and an associate professor in the departments of brain and cognitive sciences, as well as biological engineering. He got, obtained his PhD in Karl Dusroth's lab and has received just numerous awards and accolades for his groundbreaking research. Um, and he was even recently selected as an HHMI investigator. Fung discovers and develops CRISPR tools and played an extraordinarily important role in bringing the gene editing field to a point where diagnosing and treating diseases through gene therapy um, has become a realistic proposition. I'm very excited to hear his talk, the title of which is Advances in Genome Editing. Thank you. Good morning. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I, uh, uh, I <coughs> came to the McGovern Institute in uh, 2011, and uh, I remember the first time that I met with Pat uh, was during one of the first McGovern uh, Halloween parties. And, um, <coughs> and, and talking with Pat, um, I, uh, we talked about China and his experiences in developing businesses and publishing in, in China. But one thing that really made a huge imp impression on me was that he was very curious and he really wanted to understand uh, the science and, and know what was happening um, that I was going to work on. And, um, <coughs> and so, Pat, I, I'm going to give you an update on uh, what we've been working on. And um, so, <coughs> uh, we'll get the science started. So, one of the things that has motivated our work has been uh, the completion of the human genome. Um, by sequencing uh, the genome of now uh, hundreds of thousands of individuals, uh, many different genetic variants have been identified. And some of these variants are associated with disease, and some of these variants are associated with reduced uh, risk for disease. And so one of the tantalizing thought is if we can edit uh, DNA in cells, then we'll be able to much more effectively um, understand the function of these different variants, but also potentially uh, use some of these knowledge to be able to develop new treatments for disease. So over the past um, almost nine years, uh, we've been working on um, developing uh, tools uh, based on a microbial uh, immune system called CRISPR. And there are a number of different uh, proteins found in these CRISPR immune systems that can be developed uh, to uh, be able to hone into specific sequences in our DNA and then be able to make uh, specific changes uh, so that we can study genetic variants or potentially develop uh, therapeutics. There are two ways um, that um, the genome editing systems uh, are, are used. Uh, the first is using the RNA-guided nucleases. Um, examples of these include Cas9 to be able to target specific locations in the genome and to be able to either knock genes out uh, or to stimulate recombination new sequences uh, into the DNA. The second way to apply this is by inactivating the nuclease of these proteins to turn them into RNA-guided DNA binding proteins. And these act as homing devices that will allow you to bring um, a number of different effector molecules uh, to different genomic loci. You can turn genes on by bringing a transcription activator. You can turn genes off by bringing uh, histone remodelers to be able to close the chromatin. And um, you can also image uh, how DNA work or, or be able to modify DNA bases using deaminases. And so these are the two main ways through which uh, this RNA-guided DNA binding uh, system uh, has allowed it, uh, researchers to develop a number of different uh, tools for uh, probing and also to understand biology. So rather than talking to you about Cas9, I wanted to talk to you, talk to you about what's beyond Cas9. Um, to think about that, um, uh, take a look at this picture that's on the left side. Um, it shows um, the number of different uh, CRISPR systems uh, that were identified back in the year 2011. And so if you look at each one of these uh, uh, clusters of proteins, uh, these are different types of CRISPR systems. And Cas9 is this system that's down here. Um, it's much simpler than all the other CRISPR systems because it uses the least number of proteins. But what this picture really highlights is that there's enormous diversity uh, in CRISPR systems. And so one question that we asked um, was that besides Cas9, are there other relatively simple CRISPR systems that would lend themselves to development as, as interesting uh, useful technologies? So if we look at um, these diverse systems, 
we can group them into two different classes. Uh, there are what's called the class one CRISPR systems, which are ones that use multiple proteins that work together to mediate the, the recognition and also destruction of invading viruses in bacterial cells. And then Cas9 uh, belongs to uh, class two. At the time, Cas Cas9 was the only class two system that was known. And so one thing that we wanted to, um, to figure out is, are there other class two systems that haven't yet uh, been discovered from the microbial diversity? And so using computational approaches uh, to mine uh, new CRISPR sequences that haven't yet been, uh, uh, been uh, experimentally studied, we found that um, there are two new CRISPR systems uh, that uh, extend beyond Cas9. So, so there's the Cas9-based uh, CRISPR system, uh, which uh, we have developed for, for gene editing applications. But then there's also a second, also DNA-targeting CRISPR system um, characterized by a protein called Cas12. Uh, we've also developed this uh, for, for gene editing as well. And in many ways, it is much more specific uh, than some of the Cas9s that we developed. So for therapeutic applications, it has uh, particular advantages. The third system is a family characterized by a protein called Cas13. And these are RNA-guided RNA targeting enzymes. Uh, rather than targeting DNA, these allow us to develop a whole new set of tools uh, to be able to address a different set of uh, important molecules uh, within cells. And so today, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, Cas13 and the various applications that we have developed uh, using this for diagnostics and also for RNA editing applications. So this is what we know to date. But of course, as we sequence more and more organisms and profile more corners of the world, uh, it's very possible that there are going to be many other uh, CRISPR systems. And, and, uh, and many of them will be uh, potentially uh, useful uh, for developing new applications as well. So RNA um, targeting of Cas13 was first um, sort of hypothesized based on the analysis of the sequences for Cas13. So if you look at a primary sequence of protein, you will find two very well-conserved motifs that are called hepin motifs. And these are usually found in proteins that cut RNA or in toxins that are found in bacteria. And so the first thing we did is we took the whole CRISPR-Cas13 uh, system from one bacteri uh, bacteria called Leptotrichia shahi. This is a very difficult to work with organism. And so the first thing we did is to put it into E. coli so that we can experimentally manipulate it. By doing RNA sequencing, uh, we found that um, not only are the proteins expressed, but also um, the CRISPR RNA uh, is expressed, and that is modified into these short, mature uh, forms of uh, guide RNAs that uh, that's, tells us that this system is most likely uh, functional after transplantation uh, into E. coli. So then um, we found that Cas13 can target RNA. Uh, it uses a guide RNA to recognize the RNA and then, and then uh, degrade it. But what's really interesting is that it has a second form of RNA's activity. And this is what we call collateral uh, RNA's activity. So this is the way that collateral activity works. Uh, imagine this experiment here. You have a guide RNA and also a piece of RNA that's not recognizable by the guide. So there's no complementarity between the guide and this target. If you add in Cas13, then there's no cleavage of this molecule. This makes sense because there's no recognition, no cleavage. But what happens if you have both the target RNA as well as a piece of collateral RNA? What we found is that now if you add in Cas13, not only is the target RNA cleaved into different fragments, but these non-target RNA are also cleaved. And so that suggests that the, the active or the, the recognition event uh, by Cas13 with the target RNA switches Cas13 into a constitutively active state, so it can go and cut other RNA molecules as well uh, in the cell. So what is this good for? Um, one of the things that we, we uh, took advantage of this property is to develop uh, diagnostics applications, especially for infections like virus infections, uh, Ebola, Zika, or bacterial uh, pathogens. Uh, it's important to have easy, um, inexpensive, and also rapid uh, diagnostics tests so that, um, that these diseases, diseases can be diagnosed accurately uh, uh, right away. And so you can take advantage of this collateral RNAs activity to develop a, a uh, diagnostic system. And so this is the way it works. If we take human um, urine, saliva, or, or blood plasma, or even a cheek swab, uh, we can extract nucleic acid uh, from uh, these biological samples. By incubating these biological samples with 
either the cas uh, with the Cas13 protein, a guide RNA that's been programmed to recognize um, the, the virus that we're trying to detect. Uh, in this example, I'm, I'm uh, showing Zika virus. We can also uh, mix in uh, a second reported RNA that's basically um, a, a biotin and also uh, a fluorescent molecule called FAM uh, tethered together. If Cas13 recognizes a Zika virus RNA, then it will activate the nuclease activity and go and cleave uh, this reporter, and it will unlock the FAM away from, from the biotin. They'll be separated. And so what you end up is this. This property allows us to then develop a paper strip-based lateral flow test. And, and this is the way uh, this works. So if the virus is not present, then the reporter RNA will be um, intact. And that means biotin and FAM will be tethered together. So if you flow this on the lateral, fl lateral flow strip, what you'll find is that um, the sample will flow in this direction, and everything will get captured by the strip pavidin uh, binding line. And that's because biotin will get captured there, and then FAM is still tethered uh, by this RNA. If the virus is present, then when you flow this, biotin will get bound by strep habitin, but FAM will keep on flowing because it's now being cleaved off of the biotin uh, molecule. And so then it will get captured uh, by the antibody capture line. And so you will see two lines showing up rather than one line. And this provides a very easy uh, color metric based readout uh, to tell you whether or not the infectious uh, molecules uh, are, are present. And so those, these are example images of, uh, of a lateral flow based test. And so by um, supplying Zika containing samples at various concentrations, we found that uh, you can quite reliably uh, detect at about 200 uh, atomolar sensitivity. And this is about 100 molecules of virus per microliter of the biological specimen. And so this is a, a, a good sensitivity range to be able to detect uh, relatively er early stages of the virus infection. So this is for detecting uh, uh, infections. But then uh, there are also um, ways to be able to use uh, Cas13 in a more therapeutic relevant modality. And that's by developing ways to, to edit the RNA. Um, so one of the applications that we really want to develop is to be able to change uh, sequences in, in neurons. But neurons are post-mitotic. And so by using uh, homologous recombination neurons, um, it, it's proven to be very inefficient because the homologous recombination machineries are not expressed at a very active levels uh, in neurons. So being able to edit RNA provides an alternative solution to be able to make precise uh, changes uh, in neurons. And so some of the enzymes that nature has evolved uh, include proteins that can convert adenosines into inosines. And so inosines are read by the, trans the translational machinery as a guanosine. So if we can convert A to I, then we can ev effectively uh, alter the, uh, the way that uh, a mRNA can be interpreted by the cell. And so to, to turn Cas13 into an RNA editing system, uh, we, we took the wild type Cas13 and then we modified it. We get, got rid of the nuclease domain so that it only binds to RNA and it doesn't cleave. And so by using this, we can um, tether um, ADAR domains uh, to target a specific mRNA. And, uh, and so we can program um, this uh, ADAR uh, Cas13 fusion to recognize a specific mRNA by designing a guide RNA that complements the RNA that we're trying to edit. And so one of the really unique properties about ADAR is that it edits adenosines that are mismatched in the RNA duplex. And so that gives us the ability to control specifically which adenosine is edited on the target RNA. And, uh, and so the way we do this is we design a guide, and then for the base that's opposite of the A that we want to deaminate, we change it to a cytosine so that it's mismatched. And this allows us to then uh, target um, the mRNA and then form a bubble uh, at exactly the base uh, for deamination. And then ADAR will act on this bubble and then convert uh, this adenosine into an inosine and then alter the, the way that this mRNA can be translated. So this is a more detailed version of how we would go about designing it. So note, notice that this is the target RNA, and then there are multiple adenosines within the binding region by this guide RNA. Uh, but we can specify uh, the deamination of this, this uh, very specific adenosine by using a single base pair mismatch uh, to, to be able to direct it. So this is uh, just some example data showing that we can indeed control um, and, and achieve pretty specific and also accurate um, uh, editing. Uh, this is with, on the left side, this is with the first version of the repair system. 
So you can see that we get pretty good deamination at the targeted base, but there's also quite a bit of off-target activity. And then by tweaking the affinity of, of ADAR for the target RNA, we're then able to engineer a second version uh, called Repair V2 uh, that's much more specific. So now we can entirely uh, localize the editing event uh, to the targeted base and, and get rid of the other off-target uh, editing activities. So we began to apply this uh, in a, a neurological context. So we um, um, were able to engineer Cas13 so that it's small enough that we can package it along with ADAR and the guide RNA into a single AAV vector and then use this to deliver uh, into neurons. And so we targeted one of the housekeeping genes and we found that we can get uh, fairly good levels of editing. Uh, this is in primary neuron culture, and we can get about uh, close to 40% editing uh, for, for target uh, base in, in the target mRNA. And so, so we're continuing to do this, and we're now trying to apply this uh, in a couple of mouse models of neurological disease to see can we use RNA editing as a way to reverse uh, the disease phenotype. Um, we're continuing to develop RNA editing into a more broad uh, toolbox. And so one of the things we uh, have been focused on is to expand the repertoire of base changes that we can achieve uh, in, in neurons. And so um, the second editor that we've been developing uh, converts cytosines into uracils. And this has a couple of very unique applications. One of them is to ex expand the number of genetic mutations that we can, uh, we can correct. But the second is that we can transiently use the system to be able to alter uh, the signaling of, of molecules such as beta-catenin and then be able to uh, drive uh, proliferation uh, in unproliferative tissues. And, and so, for example, by making changes uh, such as S33F, we can transiently activate beta-catenin and then get it to uh, trigger proliferation in the eye or in the liver or, or in, the, in, the, in the ear. And the way we um, did this is rather than taking a natural uh, cytosine deaminase, which don't have single base specificity, we can uh, use an e space system to evolve ADAR so that it becomes a CDAR. Uh, so it changes C uh, to a uracil. And so by, by performing uh, saturated, saturation mutagenesis, uh, followed by selection and the validation in mammalian cells, we found that we can indeed get ADAR to deaminate uh, cytosines. And, uh, and so these are uh, uh, some of the, the progress that we have made so far. Uh, uh, this is uh, up to about version 8 of the, the rescue system for, for C2U editing. And, uh, and we went from uh, really no activity now to about 40% activity uh, in, the, in the target uh, cytosine base. And so we're continuing to work on this, and, and we are uh, really excited to, to also develop this uh, into, a, into a robust tool uh, with, with potential therapeutic applications. So we're continuing to, uh, to work on also increasing the specificity uh, and also the efficiency. And then, uh, and then um, hopefully next time I can tell you more about uh, our work on, on uh, testing these in animal models, uh, trying to see if we can reverse neurological disease phenotypes. So one of the things that we're really excited to, to work on uh, for, the, for the next phase is to see, can we discover other forms of novel uh, programmable systems? If you think about uh, Cas9 or, or antibodies, um, and, and this particular form of antibody found in jawless vertebrates uh, called VLR, and also the, the DNA binding domain tail. Um, these are all forms of uh, defense systems that nature has evolved to, to protect against a, num uh, a rapidly changing number of uh, pathogens. And so one question is, are there other uh, systems that nature has evolved and or continuing uh, to use computational methods now to see can we discover other forms of adaptive immune systems from the microbial world uh, to then uh, develop uh, other programmable uh, technologies. And so here's just one example of an interesting protein that we found. Uh, this is by looking for repetitive sequences that have undergone a rapid um, diversification. And so if you look at this particular one uh, from Streptococcus, it carries a very well-conserved uh, IgA protease-like domain. But then on the, on the five prime end, uh, on, on the interim, uh, there are these highly repetitive regions uh, similar to the repeat domains that you would find in a tail protein. And if you analyze each one of these repeats, you will find that they are largely identical, except they carry specific regions that, that uh, have hypervariation. And so we're working on this system. Uh, uh, we're hypothesizing that this, this is likely uh, a putatively programmable uh, protein uh, uh, protease uh, system 
So if we can figure out a way to reprogram this to target variety of proteins, uh, then we may have ways to, to use this for, for other uh, therapeutic applications, uh, maybe for, for getting rid of uh, A-beta uh, plaques or, or alpha synuclein and many other uh, different proteins. So that's really just to, to highlight the fact that we have only scratched the surface. Um, this is only the tip of iceberg. So as of last year, um, over 140,000 bacterial genomes have been sequenced. And if you look at uh, metagenomic sequences, that amount of data uh, multiplies by another order, order of magnitude. And so what this means is that there are a lot of interesting systems that await discovery. And uh, all of them will be interesting, and some of them will undoubtedly be, be useful as well. So next time, I hope to give you that update. Uh, but uh, finally, I want to acknowledge my, my, my team uh, at McGovern and the Broad Institute, uh, our collaborators, and also the funding agencies uh, that have made our work possible. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for your interest in our work. Oh, okay. hey, we have time for a couple of questions. Questions for fun? Yeah, that's a really uh, good question. So one application is to use Cas13 to target the destruction of mRNA and, and, and knock down a protein. Um, so we found that in um, eukaryotic cells, in many cells, uh, it's actually quite specific. So I've done um, transcriptome-wide uh, sequencing and, and at high depth, and we find that uh, for the transcripts we're targeting, we're really only just knocking that transcript. We've done also a comparison with, with shRNA. We find that shRNA would have maybe uh, dozens to maybe uh, 100 off-target sites. Uh, with uh, Cas13, we, we don't see that. Yeah. Any other questions? So very interesting talk. So I'm just wondering, so you've got a 40% efficiency for your AV vector in the neurons, right? So mm -hmm. in terms of reversing the uh, uh, disease model phenotype, how can, how can you control the specificity or how can you control which 40% you target in terms of reversing the phenotypes of uh, uh -huh. certain models? Um, yeah, sir, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Uh, so uh, the qu uh, maybe can, can you repeat? I'm not quite sure what you mean by it. Control which forty percent. So the uh, the efficiency you using your system about forty percent right tested in the disorder neuronal culture. Yes. Right. So in in terms of for your in vivo application, mm -hmm. so can you control uh, the you know which population you can re uh -huh. reverse in terms of uh, uh, reversing the uh, phenotype of certain neuro neurological diseases? Sure. Yeah. Thank you for the question. So the question is, uh, in the brain there are many many different cell types. Um, how do we control which cell type to edit, and can we uh, get achieve enough edit uh, in the cell type that that makes uh, that that will, that will matter? Um, so the way that we're delivering is using AAV, and there are a few different ways that we can um, limit the expression of this to the cells that we want to modify. Uh, this can be done either using cell type specific promoters uh, or by selecting variants of AAV that may have uh, some uh, specificity uh, for the cell types of interest. And so what we found in the dissociate uh, experiment is that if we target um, dissociate neurons, we can achieve on average 40% editing. And that's across all the cells within that exper uh, experimental sample. So if we deliver into neurons, um, if AV is restricted to, ex to be expressed in a specific cell population, then within all the AV transduced cells, uh, I think we'll be able to get sort of 40% or, or maybe even higher uh, editing. And then specifically how much editing is necessary to have uh, a therapeutic outcome uh, that will most likely depend on the protein um, that we're trying to fix. Some proteins don't have to be at very high levels, uh, especially uh, catalytic enzymes, whereas other structural proteins will probably need to be fixed uh, at a fairly high level. Hi. Um. I'm, this is a totally naive question, but in terms of um, 
potentially using this, these sorts of technologies? I understand this, that's a very broad question. Um, the CRISPR technologies or the, the uh, antibody technologies you were talking about. You know, what, what are the, I don't know where the technology is in terms of, you know, actually using this sort of thing for therapy. So in other words, what I'm thinking mostly about is how you would deliver uh, these things and whether yeah. they would be biologically available, particularly in the brain. Um, so yeah. maybe let's take it in this direction. You know, are there significant obstacles to say injecting these kind of things into the blood and then having them access the brain? Right. That's a very good question. Um, so so CRISPR um, CRISPR technology has gone through many iterations, and so um, now um, it's already being tested in the clinic, and there. Are Broadly speaking, two ways to develop uh, this as a therapeutic. One is through ex vivo editing, where you uh, take cells, for example, from the blood system uh, out of a patient, modify it in a petri dish, and then put it back to the patient. This can be done quite efficiently uh, using electroporation or, or transient transfection of mRNA. Um, the second uh, way to deliver is to uh, directly inject in vivo, uh, and this has been done um, using viruses, um, so AAV uh, viral vectors to deliver into specific tissues, uh, or possibly uh, in the near future using lipid nanoparticles to deliver mRNA for, for these uh, molecules. Um, one, uh, one human trial has already begun uh, in, in the Western Hemisphere, and that's for beta thalassemia. Uh, it's using ex vivo uh, therapeutic uh, delivery. Uh, and, then, uh, and then probably later this year, another in vivo approach will start uh, this is for treating a, a blindness disorder uh, by using AAV, a direct injection into the eye. Thank you for your questions, and thank you so much, Fung. Um, so a coffee break now. There's coffee outside, and we'll reconvene at 10.55. Thank you.